<laughs> Good morning to those watching on uh, YouTube. It could be evening or afternoon as well. Uh, I just got a great download, no pun intended, from one of our uh, women in, the, in our group, Nancy, who loves to watch the messages on YouTube and get so much out of them, even while she's watering uh, the plants or whatever. So I thought that was a great... Um, Great feedback, but and, and good to see everyone here, all of you lovely people, what a joy it is to be with you, and especially also to, to get into this incredible book, uh, the Psalms. So I'm ready to pray and begin. It was just, as we were driving here, um, it was just, it just clicked on my mind to pray for Pastor Josh tomorrow. Is tomorrow Sunday? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I tell you, this allergy stuff has just <laughs> knocked me into the middle of yeah. two years ago or something. I don't know. It's, I'm glad I'm not the only one. That's what You're not. About this. You're not. My gosh. So, um, but anyway, just as we're driving here, I just thought about Pastor Josh preaching tomorrow. And then I thought, you know, it'd be good to, for us to agree in prayer for him. He's not asking. It's just on my heart. And then it was also on my heart to pray for the transition. I feel like I don't pray for the transition enough, mm -hmm. and that makes me mad. So, but it helps when you're praying with others. That, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the power of corporate prayer, I think is just, is never lost on me. Was that the, was that the only thing? And then for Riverbend, so mm -hmm. just for the people of Riverbend as well. That's been on my heart because I'm writing this book on, um, I think I've got 50 reasons why David was a man after God's own heart. There are more. But, um, and one of the reasons that he, 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 he referred to the people of God as this, the saints who are in the earth in whom is the, the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. Yeah. That's amazing that David had that kind of heart for the people of God. And good morning, Myra. Good welcome. Morning. Good to see you. You are officially welcome because you've got the Riverbend sh shirt on. I came with my uniform. Uh, obviously, <laughs> you're the one led by the Spirit. I'm not sure where we're at. But, Mine was um, dirty. So, good to see you. So, um, so let's pray. I, I, um, I wonder if, if um, would anyone like to pray for the transition? I don't want to do all the praying, mm -hmm. but I, sure. there's a number of like boom, 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 boom. So Carl said he would. Yeah. You will? Okay, great. And um, well, let's pray and we'll begin. Father, thank you for uh, these men and women, your sons and your daughters. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. And we ask now that you would be glorified in all that we say and do. We ask that by the way we respond, we would bear great fruit for your name uh, and for you, Lord Jesus, all the days of our lives. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and lead and guide and teach us, but we can't learn a thing apart from you. And so we open our hearts now for you to lead and guide this time according to your perfect will. Mm -hmm. And Father, I do, we pray for Pastor Josh for the message tomorrow. Uh, we pray that the Spirit of God would come upon him in a mighty way. We ask that you would help him to thoroughly enjoy ministering together with you and for you. We ask that you would knit his heart to the people and our hearts to his in a greater way than ever. We ask that you would grant him your great wisdom, your strength for both services, and a, a, an increased freedom when he is opening up the word. Thank you for the heart that you've already given him for the church mm -hmm. and how it comes out when he speaks to the church. Would you do even more in days and weeks and years to come? And then, Father, before Carl prays for the transition, I just want to bring Riverbend before your throne of grace and ask that you would grant to every single one of us, according to the riches of your glory, to be strengthened with power through your spirit in our inner man, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, 
and that we all, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints yeah. what is the breadth and length mm -hmm. and height and depth, mm -hmm. and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Thank you, Father. Yes. Well, we do want to pray for the transition. We thank you that your heart is with the church. And Lord, you you died for our sins, yes, but also for your saints. And we pray that you will be with Josh as he takes on this new role. Open his mind and his heart to you that you would lead him and give him, give him grace and mercy to, to move forward with all the things that are involved here at Riverbend. That, that this church will not only be uh, grow and, and, and move in the community, Lord, but that you will build Josh as a leader and strengthen his heart, not only to lead us at Riverbend, but also to be a leader in the community. We love you, Lord, and we want to do our very best for you, and I know that's Josh's heart. Mm -hmm. So I pray that you would just uh, buy his, tie into that and guide him, Lord, in all that he does. And in, in having that for all the church staff, God, that you would mm -hmm. just give, make this not only a time of transition for the leadership, but a time of transition for the vision. Lord, that you would just be with us to give us all your grace as we trust you so often to do. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank, Amen. you. Thank you for being here this morning and <coughs> for coming all these weeks. So it doesn't seem like it's been very long, but um, I lost track anyway. So, <laughs> um, so um, I was thinking this morning as I was getting ready. And I know I've said this before. <coughs> I hope I've only said it once, so I'm not being a dead horse, so to speak. But I just think back over my life, and I guess you do that the older you get. And I, I, I stand in awe of what the book of Psalms has done for me. It, it's just, there's no other book in the Bible that I've read almost without fail every day. Um, and I'm talking about in the Psalms, one psalm a day. Uh, I can't say that about any other book in the Bible. Close behind is Proverbs, and I'm always in at least one gospel in addition to maybe the Old Testament and, a, and an epistle. Um, and, but that's not every day. But I can't live without the Psalms. And I think about what the Psalms, what this book has produced in me is, and I, I think I wrote them all on the board. Um, I didn't get zeal, but zeal and revival are pretty close. And I just wrote up here, I, I had hoped to do a, a passage in Psalm 119 every time we gather together just to emphasize that that chapter really is like no other anywhere in Scripture. And, you know, I don't know if you... I, I don't know that I've ever read through all of Psalm 119 in one sitting. I really don't want to. I just take a passage at a time because that that is enough. That's a lot right there. But it's it's just a go-to go to chapter when I need personal renewal or revival. And um, but beyond that, the bigger picture, I think the Psalms have stoked zeal in me for God um, for 43 years. It just, I, I don't know that there's another book in the Bible that has accomplished that as much. And kind of, you know, slash praise and worship. And this, this book, Psalms, is a book of praise and worship. It's a book of prayer. And David, I was thinking about this, maybe I'll write a chapter on it, David, we know, was a worshiper, but he has been responsible, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, if, if you will, to have led, dare I say, billions of people in praise and worship, <clears throat> because it all began with him, <clears throat> and so much of our 
praise and worship comes out of the Psalms. Um, it, it, whether it's word for word with a few verses or not, but at some level it comes out of the Psalms. Even, even the way we have praise and worship, you look at the Psalms, the latter part, drum, loud cymbals, strings, um, you know, musical instruments that he put in for uh, worship and the balance of it. You know, you have the say laws where you have just a, uh, maybe the, the instrumentation just played, so you, you pause. The say law can be a crescendo. It can be a call to quiet. Uh, obviously, the, the Psalms call us to loud singing, clapping, dancing, but also calls us to quiet solitude. So the, the balance of it, it leads us to praise, but also leads us to worship. And David, David not only wrote these things, but he led by example. And, you know, when you get your wife uh, mocking you for, for dancing before the Lord, you, that tells you that, that this man had no shame when it came to pra leading praise and worship. Good morning to Shell. Good to see Pastor Shell. Thanks for coming. Glad to see you. We're just beginning. We prayed. And uh, we're just kind of getting into it. I'm speaking just right now for, from my personal, um, all these years of studying the Psalms for 43 years of what they've done for me. But uh, for me, zeal is stirred up in me through praise and worship. And it, whether it's right here that calls me to praise and worship, and then I engage in praise and worship, and I'm not talking about just Sunday mornings. I'm talking about, you know, on the way here. We were, we were having a worship time. Well, that's what the Psalms does. The P and W is praise and worship. I should <laughs> spell that out. Then prayer. I mean, I can pray. You know, we, we just prayed. We prayed. I prayed what was on my heart. Carl prayed what was on his heart. But I can pray this word for word. And it, it helps, it has helped me grow leaps and bounds in prayer. But it's not complicated. I just pray it. <laughs> How I, you know, many times it's in the first person. But sometimes I personalize it. I make it my own prayer. And uh, if I'm not, if I'm not, if I'm struggling in my relationship with God, I just tell him. I, I don't say, and I rejoice in you always. I say, help me to rejoice in you always. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm struggling to say, I love you, Lord, help me to love you, Lord. If I'm struggling, whatever it is, and David says, I do this, then I say, help me to do it. I, I love the times when I say, I do this, but there's the, the balance, there's the honesty of prayer, the honesty of a relationship with God. You know, I, sometimes there have been times I can barely open my mouth, but thank God it's there to help me to open my mouth and pray. So I thought I'd have that on pause. So prayer, and then I looked over the years, I've written down every verse uh, or verses that I've noticed that that speak to answer prayer or promises to answer prayer. And I'm sure I must be missing some, but I counted um, approximately 38 in the Psalms, which surprises me. I thought it'd be like 138. Mm. But still, it's, it's, it's a large number, but the verses themselves, the way they describe answered prayer, it's the quality, not necessarily the quantity that does so much for me, and I'm going to get into that in just a moment. But it's it's helping me to pray, but it's giving me confidence to pray. Confidence that when I pray, God is answering. He's with me. This is what I get from the Psalms. God's Word. I mean, David has the highest view of God's Word and the magnificence of God's Word that he brings out is what keeps me in the Psalms because it's like, well, I can't miss this. 
what am I going to get today? Um, there's so much, such a reverence for God's word. And then God's nature, the way he describes nature, which I, his nature, which I've tried to bring out. Um, I feel like I haven't done as much focus on that as I normally do with some of those words, especially chesed, which I, I just feel like that's the most important word anywhere in scripture. But the other, so many other words, I mean, we define answer, answer me. A simple word like that is, um, is just incredible, or no on the beauty, the pleasantness, the delightfulness of God. So the way David and the other psalmists describe his nature, and it's not described from a distance, it's right up front. It is out of relationship that you see the psalms. And then I've just been doing, um, I did yesterday, the day before, a pretty in-depth study on fear of God, fear of Yahweh, or reverence. Approximately 62 times. Um, there's more usage of that word, but, but specifically of the fear or reverence of Yahweh, that's a lot, 62 times. I'm going to bring out, what does that look like? What does that mean? It's very broad. You can't just give one pat answer, but it's is substantial and then in my experience I, it's hard to find anywhere in scripture that produces greater intimacy with God than the Psalms because it's so raw it's so real we talked about I think lament um, how many Psalms are lament songs which I just wish the church would emphasize more because that's where we live. We, we're not always up, praise God, how you doing? Oh, bless God, I'm just conquering the world. I'm overcoming. I'm, you know, we're not always like that. Sometimes we're in the heavenlies and sometimes we're so low we're looking the, the dust off the ground. But, but when that's the case, that's why the Psalms are so important. Because that's where they were and they're called to write the Bible. That, that tells me that God said, I want you, David, to write because I see you're struggling and I'm prompting you to cry out to me because I know what you don't know, that billions of people are going to read what you've been through and be encouraged when they're as low as you are. So there's, what is it, 42, Lord, help me to get this right, 42 individual lament psalms and 16 corporate now that's that's important isn't it because when we're lamenting together mm -hmm. there's something powerful about that like <laughs> we were lamenting over these allergies I mean just knocking me to the ground and and I I keep saying thank you for sharing that because I now I know I'm not the only one like, you know, you say, what's wrong with me? Well, it's allergies are, mm -hmm. are getting to you. But, but also, when we walk in to the sanctuary on Sunday mornings, there's always going to be a large percentage, how many I don't know, that are dragging themselves <laughs> in. Or they're coming in through my prayers, because I'm always praying, Lord, don't let anybody miss today that isn't supposed to be. And what I mean by that, if you're, if we're going to a basketball game, then we're not supposed to miss. You know, I hope. I hope we check in with God first. But I'm talking about the people like me who don't want to go. I just don't. I don't want to be around anybody. I don't want to go. And usually that's a very strong sign. You need to be there because <laughs> I'm going to do something for you when you walk through that door. You're going to forget about your own problems because you're going to focus on others. And by the time you leave, you're going to say, thank God I didn't miss today. Mm -hmm. Not always, though. There are sometimes I walk out and I'm like, I, I should have just stayed home. <laughs> you know, yeah. but that's because I'm a complicated individual, right? I can't think of myself out. But it's, it's, the, it's when I can lament um, individual 
I have trouble spelling when I'm writing <coughs> in. Right. All right, so 42. How many songs are there? 150. That's a large percentage of the songs. Mm -hmm. And then when you add the two, what is that, 58? Yes. I don't know what you math whizzes are, probably <laughs> could spit out a percentage. Almost a third, so better than a third. Better than a third. Okay, so that's substantial. That, that means something. You know, the parables of Jesus, a third of his teaching is in parables. Mm. So that ought to tell us we should understand what parables are. What, what's the purpose of a parable? How do you interpret a parable? When you know that much of his teaching is in parables, and even that, at the time when someone taught in parables, it was their responsibility to go to the teacher and say, explain to us the parable. That's what's shocking when Jesus taught the parable of the sower and several others. The crowd just walked away. But the disciples didn't. They said, Lord, teach us the parable. And so he says, to you the mysteries of the kingdom are revealed, but to them it's not. Well, them, they knew that. They knew if they don't ask for the parable, they're going to walk away without understanding and they're going to walk away empty-handed. That was the Jewish culture. It's your responsibility. The wow. teacher teaches the word, your responsibility to understand it. Anyway, um, so more than a third, that's why we love the Psalms. Because we can identify, because we're not always one walking 100%, you know, right? We're not always walking in the Spirit. We don't always feel like praying. We don't. But that's why we need this, because we need our minds renewed. We need revival. We need renewal. We need the intimacy of God, right? The that's why the Psalms are so good. The exact percentages are 42 is 28%, and 58 of them is 38.8%. Wow. Thank you very much. <laughs> don't know if that's city, bro, but information. Yeah. Like me, I don't even want to try to type it in the calculator. I'm just, all I know is it's a lot. So I, I just, math and I are not real good friends. That's why I use a calculator. Science and I are enemies. Why don't I have to take, why don't I have to take biology? I hated that. I wanted to say, why not? I'm not going to use this. And I'm not going to use algebra. And I'm not going to use trigonometry. And I was right. Forget <laughs> chemistry. And, and I'll use the All right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, if you don't understand, you just go to the smart people and they can figure it out. Mm -hmm. Then you're good. Yeah, we so, have a great team. Oh, it's you need to know reasons. people that know. Yes. yes yeah, that's absolutely. right. Yeah. You don't always have to have everything in your head. But Amen. That's right. You get to know people that have it yeah. in their head, and you just go, if I want something about songs, I'm coming to Brad. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. There yeah. you go. Mm -hmm. He's, I, I call uh, him my Bible answer man. <laughs> so you may call him that also. And you may literally call him with the questions. <laughs> well, if those of you who are listening to YouTube, if you're in high school, just take what I just said out of here. <laughs> I, I don't want to be that influence. Here's, here's the wisdom the Lord dropped on me years later when I wrestled with that, yeah. that whole issue. Lord showed me that it's not necessarily knowing subjects, but each, each one of those types of thinking helps you develop your brain to do different problem solving. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, so no wonder my brain has only been developed this way. <laughs> I think the Lord was saying you can't get out of it because that's why I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah. I'm in trouble. Brain. I burnt my algebra book. Oh, God. <laughs> and I have my mom take a picture. After algebra three, I said, you get the camera out. You know, big camera, not little phone. And we had a tub out in the yard for burning, and I said, burn it, every one of these out your Whoa! <laughs> I, so I, I thought I was extreme. No. <laughs> you hear that? Yeah, it's yeah, I mean, burn it, algebra books. Oh. It's a big How do you really right. feel about algebra, Debbie? <laughs> right. I got beats, but it hurt. It hurt. It hurt. It hurt. <laughs> Wow. She's not getting out of this now. No wonder so I like her. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you really do her, she has every book that I think she's ever had. Yeah. We still have them. It's except math books. <laughs> <laughs> no, those now. Bye bye yeah. math. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Algebra. Yeah. Well, with all that, 
Mm -hmm. Um, The two things I wanted to cover today are prayer, especially promises to answer prayer, and the fear or the reverence of God. I don't think we talk about that enough. Why is it important? It, It clearly was major to David, but it's major throughout Scripture as well. And we need that. I need, I can't have enough of the reverence for God, the awe of God, the fear of God. Matt, I do like to define it as reverence or awe so that we understand. This. I know Christians have a difficult time feeling worthy to, to come before God. And that's what the blood of Jesus does. So it, I think it's important when you say fear of God to someone that's already struggling in having a relationship with God, we're just talking respect, mm-hmm. awe, mm-hmm. reverence. And we all, I think we get that. We need that. And um, so if you'll turn with me to Psalm 4, Psalm chapter 4, and we're just going to read verses 1 through 3 for now. Psalm 4 and verses 1. 1 through 3. Psalm of David. And notice the very first thing that he says. Answer me. Mm -hmm. Now, I bet that that is an imperative. Sorry, I meant to turn my phone down. I thought I did. I did do that. Why, Why did it ding? I didn't touch it. No, I didn't mute it. All right. So if I if I were to go to Bible Hub and click on Psalm four, so I I go to New American Standard, the the official translation from heaven. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And Strong's and Concordance, and then I click on. Mm. Let me get down to Psalms. I'm positive that it's a an imperative, which is a command, which normally would be a command for us. So an imperative uh, from God is a command, but when it's man to God, it is a cry of urgency. Mm-hmm. And there it is. Call imperative, which means answer me, not just now, but I'm asking you to answer me all the time. And it's a, it's a it's a command literally. But it's not David commanding God, but it is it is not a shy prayer. Let's put it that way. So, what does that do for us? That gives me license or an open door as his son or as his daughter to walk in and say I need this from you and not hold back, and not be shy, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Does, does Nathan, is he, oh, Mom, I, I really want this, but I'm not so sure I, I should ask. No, he just, he's unashamed. Am I right about that? He's unashamed. I want this. And now, I'm sure you're working on the polite part. He does a great job with your stuff. <laughs> that's true. That's right. I should have known. De- he doesn't demand. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but with other kids, <laughs> but so so that's what you want. You want the politeness, the respect, and mm-hmm. and the unabashed nature of you're my mom, and and I can't get this apart from you. I need this from you. And then I wouldn't be surprised if he also thanks you afterwards. Because that's what we have to do as well. We have to learn to thank God for answered prayer. And not be like the ten lepers. How many? Think about that. Leprosy was healed. That's a death sentence. And only one turned back and thanked. And Jesus taught that. Mm-hmm. Does that is that is it important from for God? that we express gratitude is very important. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Mm -hmm. Psalm 118, Psalm 136. I mean, it's just everywhere. Um, And Paul says um, 
in everything give thanks. Um, uh, what does he say in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18? Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you. So it's it's a it's a it's a learning a lifestyle. But so he right off the bat answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Now it's a difficult part of Hebrew to translate, but it most likely is David saying, you are my righteousness. Then David had an understanding of justification by faith in the Old Testament. That's a big deal. So answer me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. So there I can, when I'm distressed, what can I do? I can say, would you relieve me in my distress? Why not? Does God love David more than he loves me? Absolutely not. Not a chance. So I can say, you did it for David. Do it for me. Just like that. So clearly he's in a state at this point. This is not a happy-go-lucky psalm. This is a cry from David, the man after God's own heart, I need you. I need you to step in. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. You hear the, the intensity that's coming out. Now, what does that word gracious mean? It means it's a heartfelt response. A heartfelt response from someone with something to give to someone in need who has no real claim to gracious treatment. I cannot demand that you be gracious to me. I am asking you to be gracious to me. But when I know what that word means, and I know that's his nature, going back to the, how David and the psalmist describe the nature of God, what does that do? That gives me confidence to walk in the door like I belong and to say, I need you to be gracious to me. It also can mean to, to bend or stoop in kindness. And here's, here's Pastor Michelle having a rough time. So God comes, he bends and stoops in kindness to help her out. That's a, that's a, a word picture of Hebrew, of, of bending and stooping in kindness. That's who God is. That's, that's what the Psalms describe. That's what the Old Testament describes far more powerfully than the New Testament. That's my experience. That's why the Old Testament is so, so important. And you can't go anywhere in the Psalms without finding that word gracious. I, I mentioned that to you at the very first time when we started in Psalm 86. Still trying to finish Psalm 86. Remember, and I brought you back to Exodus 34, verse 6, when... Um, Let's just hold your place there and turn with me to Exodus 34. 6, where that verse, Psalm, Exodus 34, verse 6. Um, Exodus 34, verse 6. Then Yahweh passed by in front of Moses and proclaimed. Proclaimed. This is... Mm -hmm. This is a big time announcement of good news. Proclaim Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim. Mm -hmm. Two names together always are indicative of affection. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if Yahweh wanted to utter this in a different way, it could have literally killed Moses. But he is trying to reveal to Moses who he really is. And so he comes with a gentle voice. That's how we know it was gentle, it was full of love, full of grace. Can you just imagine if you heard that? Yeah, and God just came to you and said, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim. I mean, may he enable us to hear that. Yahweh, Yahweh, Elohim, compassionate and gracious. Now, compassionate is a Hebrew word 
that refers to a deep love from a superior to an inferior. It doesn't say love. That's why it needs to be defined. It is a, not just love, it is a deep love from a superior to an inferior. So when Moses hears that, Racham, he, he's like, wait, say that again? You have a deep love for me? Like, do you know who you're talking to? And he's, yes, I do know who I'm talking to, and I want you to hear what I'm saying. This is how I relate to you. I am compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Abounding. Not just I have, but overflowing with chesed and truth. And that verse is repeated at least 14 times in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. My friends, that is massive. And it's David uses it three or four times in the Psalms. Psalm 86 and elsewhere as well. And he uses portions of it even more than that. In fact, in Psalm 30, he, he says, and this is a Psalm 30 verses 4 and 5, it, it relates to everything that, that I've written on the board. I'm going to get back to Psalm 4, I think. <laughs> uh, Psalm 30, verse 4. Sing praise to Yahweh, you his godly ones. Now, godly simply just means devoted. It doesn't mean you don't have sin. It doesn't mean <clears throat> perfection. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means you're devoted to God. Well, and sometimes not so well. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. And David is writing this. Did David always... <coughs> did he always express pure devotion to God? No. This man of God is always confessing his transgressions, iniquities, and sins. But did he ever indicate, I'm not devoted to you? Never. Never. He was devoted to God through thick and thin. Sing praise to Yahweh, you as godly ones, and there it is. Give thanks to his holy name. Hallowed be your name. For, here's the reason, his anger is but for a moment. Literally, the Hebrew says... <coughs> Blink of an eye. You just blink your eye. That's how long God's anger lasts. So if you're struggling, if I'm struggling with prayer, why can't I just say thank you that your anger is but for a moment, a blink of an eye, but your favor is for a lifetime. <coughs> now when we declare that to God, something happens in our minds and hearts. And if you spend the rest of your life saying, thank you, that your anger is put for a moment, but your favor is for a lifetime, what do you think that will do to you? It's, it's going to have an impact on you. What do you think it will do if you share that with someone else? Do you know what I read? Or here's, do you know the Bible says that his anger lasts for a moment, a blink of an eye, but his favor for a lifetime? And that person's down? Do you know what it's going to do to them? Isn't it lift them up? Or if you open to Psalm 30 and say, would you mind reading that out loud? And if, if they're good with that, then they finish. Ask them to read it one more time. Say, I don't mean to push, but would you read it a third time? <laughs> Just let them see it and hear themselves say it. Something happens inside of us. Weeping may last for the night. Boom. Lamentations. But a shout of joy comes in the morning. How often has that been my case? How often? There's something about the morning. There's just something about the morning. So that, I'm sorry, so I read it because that is a part, he's quoting part of Exodus 34, verse 6. He doesn't quote the whole thing, but he quotes part of it. His anger is for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. 
And then, so back in uh, Psalm 4, he says, um, wait a minute, where is it? I thought, I thought that was loving kindness and truth. Well, that was Exodus 34, verse 6. Uh, abounding in chesed and truth. Abounding. Chesed, let me just define it again, because it's so, so important, because it says everything about who God is, how he relates to us, how he wants us to relate to him, and how he wants us to relate to others. I think if I could just get this to Christians, when you say you love me, you you better understand what you're what you're saying to me. Don't be trifling with that word. Because what if what if now tomorrow I say something or do something that you don't like? Is that going to change your love for me? I'm serious. No, 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 no. Love is not an emotion for a Christian. Love is a decision. It's mm -hmm. We are in covenant with one another. That means when Peter said, how often shall I, my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times, I'm good. After that, I'm going to lay it on. Because mm -hmm. right? the <laughs> rabbi said, I'll have to forgive three times. Mm -hmm. So I'm willing to go more than double. I'm, I'm good, Jesus, right? Just pat me on the back. And he's probably saying that in front of his the other guys. <laughs> and one of them he was probably having a knockdown drag out, fierce argument with. <laughs> Peter, don't ask the Lord any questions. Let Thomas do the asking. You're just gonna get yourself in trouble. <laughs> now I would love to see his face when he said, Peter. Uh, I can show you his face. <laughs> Not seven times, 490 times. He was like, John, John the whispering in here, he's saying, I told you. I told you what? Just shut up. Don't, you're just asking for trouble. Chesed is. Chesed. And in Hebrew, it's written there, so it's pronounced. Can you say that? You're, see, you're Jewish, Jewish now. <laughs> yes. Okay. And it's covenant loyalty. Loyalty. So God is a loyal God. Amen. He's loyal to Amen. us. Devotion is very similar. He's devoted to us. So I never, ever, ever have to wonder whether God is loyal to me right. or devoted to me. I, that's seven. But well, filled with kindness, too. Well, then there's mercy. Okay? No way can I exist for a single second without God's mercy. Not a chance. And I need His mercy every single day. Mercy, that's three. Faithfulness. You see how similar faithfulness and devotion and covenant loyalty are. I, I'm just seeing that for the first time ever. They, there's so much similarity there. That's four. Um, steadfast love. Steadfast love. Is your love steadfast? Toward everybody? Perfect. All the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> But is that where we want to go? Yes. And can we get there? Yes, we can. Yeah. Because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And prayer. Meaning sometimes you have to wrestle with God and just say, I really struggle with this person. Like, I don't want to be around them. I don't like them. <laughs> And then already I know I'm fighting a losing battle. So I just have to say, okay, Lord, help me to love them like you love them. Is that a prayer God wants to answer? Yeah. No question about it. And favor. Who among us can live without the favor? His favor lasts for a lifetime. That's not 
that word in, in uh, favor in Psalm 30, verses 4 through 6, is not hesed. There's another word for that. But see, that is how, this is who God is. It's how he relates to me. It's how he wants me to relate to him, but, but only from a standpoint of loyalty, devotion, faithfulness, steadfast love. He doesn't need my favor. He doesn't need my mercy. That's the difference. But you need it. Mm -hmm. You need it from me just like I need it from you. So you drop, you know, I'm depending on you for X, Y, Z, and you drop the ball. So I say, well, I'm never depending upon them again. Oh, really? God says, oh, oh really? you're going to adopt that attitude? So can I just point out to you how many times you brought the ball with others? Mm -hmm. Oh, got a little self-righteousness, do you, <laughs> inside? Mm, need a little repentance and humility, do you? <laughs> yes, sir, I do. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. I mean... That, I've had that conversation a million times. You're not all that. Amen. <laughs> so, has said, so I, I, I haven't done this for a long time, but on my prayer walk in San Jose, at like Guadalupe, Oakwood, Grove Park, I remember how often I'd be walking and there's a big mountain peak called Mount Amunum. It's an Indian name. I have no idea what it means. But I renamed it El Shaddai. I just said, okay, in the millennium, Lord, that mountain's called El Shaddai. Just did it. And as I'm walking towards it, I would say, Father, thank you for your chesed toward me. Thank you that you are infinitely, perfectly loyal to me. That's how I talk to God. Thank you that you are infinitely, perfectly devoted to me. Thank you for your infinite, perfect mercy towards me. Thank you that you are infinitely, perfectly faithful to me. Thank you that you are infinite and perfect in your steadfast love. And at the time, I didn't even know favor was a part of that meaning. I only found that out later. So why not talk to God that way? When you say, hallowed be your name, why not say something like that to him? Uh, it, it will build intimacy. Just like David, the man after God's own heart. Why not? Why not talk to him that way? Because that's what God says to you and to me about himself. So, this is bold praying that's appropriate for a son or daughter of God our Father through Jesus Christ. It builds confidence in us. It builds security in us. It transforms us and it changes the way we relate to others. So now, because that's the way God deals with me, I am obligated to walk that way with you. And if I fail, then you know what I need to do? I need to come to you right away and say, would you forgive me? Why is it that Christians don't do that? Just, why do I not hear Christians say, would you please forgive me? It's very rare. Why? Why? Do you, why can't we just say, would you forgive me? I blew it. Do you think it's because if we ask God for forgiveness and to forgive that person, we don't have to go to them directly? That we think it's enough. Yeah, if, if I blow it with you, and I say, Lord, forgive me, that's good, you but you it. don't know. Right. That's only half of it. Yeah, you still That's only half of it. it. But people don't think that way. But people don't think that way. But I want to know why. Yeah. Why do we? Why, why? Do we not value humility with action? Like, please forgive me. I think every marriage should be based on four words. I love you. I mean, I don't mean four things. <laughs> I love you. Please forgive me. I forgive you. Thank you. <clears throat> you won't make it without that. 
<laughs> no. You no. Married, you you need that. <laughs> we know. <laughs> I shared that in Kenya. You would have thought the world caved in. That I'm still hearing people say to me, I'll never forget what you shared. I had no idea it would make that much of an impact. Mm -hmm. But I mean, why not just simplify things? And if you base a marriage on that, we are always saying thank you to one another always mm -hmm. that's a strength of our marriage Be kind yeah. yeah it's kindness mm -hmm. it's appreciation who doesn't want appreciation who doesn't want thing now who's the one that's always saying please forgive me in my marriage <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because she's perfect. No, no, we like her. She's perfect. <laughs> yeah, thank you. But something not right about that. Nancy <laughs> gonna be able to be out. Uh, yeah. He's like, no, but I remember oh. with my kids. I used to make. I I so, totally believe that if you screwed up, you had to ask for forgiveness, even with them. Mm -hmm. And I am so glad that I did. And I mean, I would say to them, like, you shouldn't have done this, but I should not have gotten mad and yelled. And I, this, and my um, daughter-in-law, Stephanie, says to me about my son, Brandon, she said, he forgives, asks forgiveness within a minute of everything he does. But it was because he was role modeled it so much wow. for me because he was so bad. <laughs> he was a destroyer, and he ended up being the one that was ordained pastor of the three. I mean, he would go and I would put him in the corner. He tore the wallpaper out of the corner. I just time out. He would like unroll things, destroy things. He would paint things with spray paint. He just did horrible things. Wow. But and if, so, if I responded inappropriately, I would always say, you know, I should, you should have done this, but I should have done it. But it, yeah. and I thought I was failing, and not that that's good what I did. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. the Lord showed me how because I did respond correctly. He is the first to ask forgiveness now, and I role model for him that we do need to do that. And I'm yeah. Amen. And just think of the fruit that he's given mm -hmm. to people yeah. all mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. Humility is an attractive thing. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most attractive human qualities mm -hmm. there is. We don't think that. We don't think, and in fact, no, 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 sure. a woman or a man who is humble is a powerful man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember when I learned the definition of meekness, it kind of blew my mind. Cause, and then I had trouble seeing God as meek because it sounded weak to me. I, it just did. Even the word meek, like mm -hmm. pitiful and, you know, but that it's power and control. And mm -hmm. that's wild that's right. mm -hmm. to think of meekness as power in control. You know, we don't have a superhero that's that. <laughs> They're all, they are powerful. Yeah. So I think that's just such a good way to think of the Lord and that it mm -hmm. meekness is power in control, meaning you have the power to override, yell, whatever, but you're in control. That's good. Mm -hmm. Amen. What's the best horse? The best horse has power under mm -hmm. control. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's what that, and Jesus used two different words to describe himself. As humble. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's a claim to deity. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Gentle mm -hmm. is proutes, strength under control. Gentle and humble in heart mm -hmm. is a long Greek word, tape nafrasune, and it means one who is unassuming. So that if he walked in this room, unless he revealed himself to us, we would just go, who is that? But he would not take over. He would not come in and say, all right, that's Brad, step aside. I'm in control here. Got this. Uh uh. He would just sit there and you'd never know it. That's who he is. When he says it about himself, no wonder he's so attractive. No wonder the disciples were devastated. Utter devastated. Utterly devastated when he said, I'm going away. You can't do that. We they were, they were so in, in love with him, so devoted to him, albeit very imperfectly, there's no question about it, but at least we can hand it to them that they were <clears throat> devastated. 
because there's an attractive quality. I mean, John, uh, Luke 15, 1, the sinners and tax collectors were coming to him just once. But this, they, they certainly didn't go to the Pharisees or the scribes. And the Pharisees and the scribes had wanted nothing to do with them. But they went to Jesus because it was, he didn't compromise his message. He led them to faith in him. But they saw in him a man, and more than a man who was wide open to their lives, who was more interested in them than anybody else they had ever met. Who is this? I was just reading John 1 the other day when, when uh, John the Baptist said, for the second time, the Lamb of God. In this case, he didn't say it takes away the sin of the world. He said that in verse 29. Two of his disciples heard him and left him. Andrew and most likely John. And they, they said, where, where are you staying? Come and you'll see. That was most likely 10 a.m. By the next day, Andrew was going to his brother Peter and saying, we have found the Messiah. Come and see. What happened in that one day? Well, no doubt Jesus took them through the Old Testament. But they'd never been around someone like this either. I mean, later they said, no man has ever spoken the way this man spoke. The ones that were sent to take him down came back and said, sorry, we couldn't. No one's spoken like this. So, well, is that any surprise when David says in Psalm 27, verse 4, uses that word noam. One thing. Why? Why was David a one thing man? One thing I have asked from Yahweh, that I am seeking, that I may dwell, and I'm going to apply it this way, that I may dwell in the presence of Yahweh all the days of my life, to behold the noam of Yahweh, the pleasantness or delightfulness. Now, the New American Standard translates it beauty. Read Revelation 4 you'll understand about the beauty of God. To behold the noam of Yahweh and to meditate in his presence. So David, why am I writing that book? Why was David a man after God's own heart? What do I have to learn from David? David says, I'll teach you. Do you know that my God is pleasant and delightful to be with? Never thought of it that way. Yes, that's, that's who he is. That's what he's like. Oh, well, I'm not quite there yet. Honesty with God. I want to know what they do. Would you show me how pleasant and delightful you are? Well, once you get a hold of that, you can't be stopped, right? Because you need more. You want more. So why not just say, when I sit down open, can you reveal your pleasantness and delightfulness to me? Is that a prayer? You, what prayer like that would he not answer? But are you willing to be patient? Am I willing to be patient until it happens? That's the Psalms. The nature of God, the word of God, it sets us free. The truth sets us free. So... I'm trying to get through Psalm 4, but you won't let me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So he says, be gracious to me and hear my prayer. See that perseverance? Answer me and hear my prayer. So David understood you have to persevere in prayer. And then he, he says, O sons of men, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? But know that Yahweh, verse 3 of, of Psalm 4 now, but know that Yahweh has set apart the godly man for himself. Yahweh hears me when I call to him. Now that's a verse I memorized 
as a young believer, and I use it all the time in prayer. Father, thank you that you have set me apart for yourself. You hear me when I call you. Now, when you say that, then your, your shoulders are back, your head's lifted high, and that, that is a description of an understanding of sonship. Why not? That's who you are. That's who you belong to. And know that Yahweh has set apart the godly man or woman for himself. But godly means devotion. That means I have to grow in godliness or Christ-likeness. So if I fall short, thank God I got the gift of repentance. So I can just ask and then let's move on. Right? So Nancy, when you said to your son, this, you shouldn't have done this, I shouldn't have done this, that's the gift of repentance in effect, mm -hmm. and in you, move on. And look at the fruit from that. How else can we walk with God without the gift of repentance? It is a gift. Mm -hmm. So, but a godly man or a woman will ask for repentance because he or she is devoted. Here I am with all my weaknesses, but I belong to you. So if I can take that posture, your word says, and just say it like that to him, Father, hallowed be your name. Thank you that your word says, you set me apart for yourself. You hear me when I call you. And yet, David is persevering in prayer. So he hears me, it doesn't mean he's going to answer me right away. That's the, yes. the dynamic of, of prayer. We don't like that. We want answers right now. And we are more at a disadvantage than any other group of Christians in the history of the world. Why? Because we get everything we want when we want it. And that is detrimental to our faith. God is not going to adjust himself to me. Sorry, not going to happen. I have to adjust myself to him. That I have to get settled. And I'm still working on it. Because if you just adjust yourself to me, we can run this world much better. I've got this figured out. I know how it works. Just do things my way. We're good. Yeah? No, it doesn't work that way. God is slow. Not only to anger, but slow to answer prayer sometimes. Mm -hmm. A lot of times. Mm -hmm. But sometimes he's not. Sometimes he answers right away. Mm -hmm. We can go on all day as we study the theology of prayer. Why does he delay? Mm -hmm. and there, the list is long. We won't go into that now. But I just want to give that to you. That you can inculcate, in, embed that in your spirit that you are his son or daughter. You have wide open access and this is what he says about you. And if that's the main takeaway from the book of Psalms, then praise God. But then there's Psalm 116 in verse 1, one through 2 to my other favorite verses. I'm sure I must have quoted them before. But I don't think enough. This again is not, this one does not say that David wrote Psalm 116. Um, so Psalm 116 verses 1 and 2. I love Yahweh. I love Yahweh. Ah, oh, this word is so good. I got to erase this here. And just define it. Because what does he mean by it? What, what? This is not chesed. He doesn't use this word. It is ahav. Ahav. It's 
written with a B, but it's pronounced with like a V, a hob. It is a friendship love. Oh, how awesome that is. What did Jesus say about you? He calls us friends. He calls us friends. Next time we sing that song, I am a friend of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you just say, say it. Thank you, Father, that I am your friend. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that I am your friend. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Joy Hargett, the last time we did that, I mean, that woman just knocked that song yeah. out of the park. Mm -hmm. And I told her, I said, I've never heard anybody mm -hmm. sing that song the way you did. It was, it was just, my jaw was dropped. And I, I've never really, that's not been one of my favorite songs because it maybe the way it's done and just uh, kind of cheesy. I don't know, maybe that's not fair. I just, just not one of my go-to songs. But when she did it, I was like, something happened. <coughs> something happened. So I, I think I want to wave a wand and say, no one else can ever sing that song but Joy. <laughs> that's what David says. I love the Lord. He doesn't say, I love you, Lord. He's saying that to everybody. David's a teacher. I love Yahweh. Personal act of covenant keeping one. Because he hears my voice. So you say, David, tell me about God. Oh, I'd be happy to. He hears my voice. Okay. You're under the old covenant. I'm in the new covenant. And I don't have that confidence. What's wrong with me? I love Yahweh because he hears my voice. Call. It's the Hebrew K Q Q A L means active. He always hears my voice and my supplications cry for grace. Remember I defined that word gracious? This is a request, be gracious to me. You see the humility that David had? Dependency upon God. No shame about it. Because he has inclined his ear to me, the Hebrew word means to stretch out the ear. I love this language because it's so colorful. The word pictures he opened his mouth. We don't say that. He said, but he opened his mouth. Just the colorful way, the expressive ways that, that the Hebrew language is. Because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. So I committed that to memory many years ago, and I even have it written down in Luo, the language in, in Kenya, and I say that to them every now and then. I just break it out. Because mm -hmm. they're not being taught that. Mm -hmm. But if this crazy Muzungu is saying it, the best pronunciation I can muster, that's gonna give faith, it's gonna, it's gonna do something to them. Mm -hmm. But imagine if every Christian adopted this with conviction, memorized it, <coughs> spoken. Thank you, Father, that your word, before I ask a thing, thank you that your word says that you hear my voice and my supplications. Because you have inclined your ear to me, therefore I will call upon you as long as I live. I love you. Why not talk to him that way? Or would you say, maybe we could say, help me to love you. Mm -hmm. Just be honest with them. But by, by internalizing this, it renews our mind. It shows us God the way he really is, not the way I am constantly misunderstanding him as. Right. And it narrows the gap. It changes my prayer life. And if I share it with others, how many are going to say, I never knew that was a where, where's that verse again? Let me just 
Would you read that? No. That's the Psalms. Mm. Thoughts, questions? <coughs> you all are pretty quiet today, but maybe it's it's the subject material is pretty. If you haven't seen the um, first three are out now of season five of The Chosen, there is a scene in there where Peter is talking to Jesus and asking about the how often do I forgive my brother? Wow. And he's talking about Matthew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. So if you haven't got that picture, I do. As soon as you yeah. said it, I was like, I remember that scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. <sighs> when you were talking about Jesus being so unassuming, it yeah. made me think of the road to Emmaus. When Jesus caught up and began walking with the two strangers yeah, and asked them why they were upset they explained about Jesus and then he just let out all the scripture mm -hmm. and then he was gone they said how our hearts burned <laughs> when he was here and he, they wanted more they wanted him to stay you know and that's that communication that even when you don't know you need it there are times when he will just burn in your heart and you go, oh, I want more, I want more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but they, you know, soon found out who they had been with, for sure. But wow. And, and the funny thing is <laughs> they looked at him and said, where have you been? Well, oh, Pastor Bobby, he, he's, he always goes, he, when he tilts that head, yeah. you know, <laughs> tilts that head, puts his arms out like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you the only one in Jerusalem that hadn't heard what's going on? Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine that? Yeah. <laughs> and, and he's just resurrected. I mean, he could have said, I am. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but he just casually asked questions. That's yes. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, what a couple of verses come to me. The Hebrew word, I mean, the Greek word there, too, is pros, it's intimacy. It's always, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, pros, intimacy. The word, Jesus, and the Father, with, describes that relation. And then the rest of John's gospel brings that out. I don't do a thing unless... I see the Father. I don't say anything unless that kind of come to me. So he's a relational God. There's no other relational God ever in the history of the world. Not, not in Islam, not in Hinduism, Buddhism, none of it. It's not, not among the Greek gods and goddesses, not among the Canaanites, not even close. <clears throat> Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened. But that mostly had to do with the burden of, of they were carrying of the false teaching of the Pharisees and that you have to keep the law. Mm. And the people were just so burdened. And I will give you rest, which is renewal. Take my yoke upon you farming, agricultural term, you know, the yoke that you put on two oxen. And that's a term of irony. You take my yoke, let's walk together. And for my yoke is easy, mm -hmm. and my burden is light. So we're not experiencing that. It's not his fault. It's something missing in me. Mm. Uh, for I am proutes, gentle, not harsh. But isn't that, isn't that how God spoke to Moses? Mm -hmm. Yahweh, Yahweh, compassionate and gracious, right? For I am gentle and humble in heart. But it's really, I am humble and humble in heart. Mm -hmm. And you will find rest for your souls. Mm -hmm. That describes no one, pleasant, delightful. So it's just that you see how much we 
we have to renew our minds, but our faith is an adventure. It's exciting, it's mm -hmm. life-giving, it's liberating, it's real. It's real, it's eternal. This is what the people of the world need. Mm -hmm. Augustine said you, um, he said, uh, I'm trying to, he said, our heart, our hearts, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Mm. And that's, that's the problem in the world. It's, people don't come to him because they love their sin more than they love him. But when he reveals himself to us, that's when we, we, we say goodbye to our love for sin and our, our sinful nature and come to him. And then we find out we're much more free than we ever imagined. So this is the Psalms. All this from the song. I'm just trying to figure out what time it is. Ten twenty. Yeah, I want. I want to. I said I just covered my. Because I I'm pretending it's not like a number. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got plenty of time. It's only nine twenty. It's not. It's not Sunday yet. Not Sunday. Yet. <laughs> yeah, not What's Sunday your hurry? Yet. We got you know. Mm -hmm. Got bathrooms. Got a kitchen. Got plenty of food over there. You can order it. It's, it's for tomorrow, but that's okay. They won't mind. I will. <laughs> Okay, bad decision. <laughs> um, last thing, we got we got a few minutes. Let me just uh, point you to Psalm thirty-four, and uh, there there are I mentioned on the board sixty-two times approximately where David uses the fear of Yahweh. Um, yeah, you do. Mm -hmm. I have Psalm 34 marked. Yeah. You got it all. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. Oh, it is. It, thank you for sharing that. Um, in Psalm, one, Psalm 19, he says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Mm. And um, so it's Psalm 34. Um, verse 9. <clears throat> Oh, fear Yahweh, you his saints. Isn't that interesting? For those who fear him, there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, verse 10. But they who seek Yahweh shall not be in want of any good thing. So that defines what fear is. Isn't that interesting? We wouldn't normally think that way. You fear or revere Yahweh, you seek him. That's one Example, come, you children, listen to me. Look at how David speaks tenderly to them, just like John the Apostle did in First John. <clears throat> and I will, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. <clears throat> Look at that. David is saying, "I will teach you the fear of the Lord." Mm -hmm. And yet, did he always fear God? No, not always. Mm -hmm. But he could say he feared God. <clears throat> so that is encouraging to us. David is not perfect. But yet I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. That's just one definition of the fear of Yahweh. But let me give you a remarkable definition from Isaiah 33, 6 which I have been praying, it's been one of my prayers that I've been praying for you, um, I don't know, the last several months. Isaiah 33 and verse 6. I pray verses 2 and 6 over you and all of God's people. I, Isaiah 33 and verse 2 and 6. This is how I pray. Oh Lord, be gracious to us. We have waited for you. Be our strength every morning, our salvation also in the time of distress. Be, verse 6, be the stability of our times. A wealth of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. Let the fear of the Lord be our treasure. We don't normally think about the fear 
of the Lord being something that we treasure. <clears throat> that, that just jumps out of me. Isaiah saw the fear of the Lord as something to treasure or value. So now when you put it that way, I say I need more of the fear of Yahweh. And oh my gosh, there was one more Oh, Lord, don't let me forget it. Treasure and where else? Somewhere else, the perspective of it was very powerful. And I I knew I should have written it down. I thought, no, no, I, I won't forget it. Yeah, I'm forgetting it. So if I remember it, I'll text it to you. But I just think when we need the right perspective from Scripture. Because if we, if we don't see it that way, we go, oh, fear of God. Don't, don't get me, but when Isaiah says it's something we treasure, then I say, okay, now that, that's what I need, that's what I want. Um, it just puts in great, great perspective our faith, reverence, awe. Let's pray before we come into say the services on Sunday morning. Let's pray that something will happen to us over and over and over that a reverence will come upon us. Like a holy awe. It's only happened to us once. We were at a conference in 1984 and the Lord came mm -hmm. There were five, 6,000 people, and we were on our faces and didn't say a word. It was. And I've never had an experience like that again since then. And I was praying that the leader would not say anything. Mm -hmm. Lord, don't let him say, don't let him break this moment. Mm -hmm. And he did. <laughs> but it seemed like it lasted forever. Mm -hmm. I longed for that. But I need it personally, but I, I long for that corporately where God will show up. We need that, but let's ask him. Let's just say, come with your kavod, your, your heavy presence. Come with your shakane, your dwelling presence. Come with your sweet presence, Lord Jesus. And let us learn to stand in awe of you and reverence of you. Um, I think if we pray, if we ask him for that, he'll do it. He, I think he wants to. I think I know he does. Thoughts, questions, comments? I do. I don't know if you can answer it quick. But um, this goes worth it. And what is your favorite song? Can you pick one? Oh, gosh. Mm -hmm. yeah. did you do that? Oh, I'd say based on the number of times I read it, <coughs> I'd say Psalm 40. Mm. Psalm 34 is pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe my favorite song to preach on is Psalm 1. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I'd say Psalm, Psalm 40. It's about comfort. <coughs> Yeah. Comfort. Yeah. Okay, I just wonder. Then I have one oh. funny quick story to tell you about math and how much you hate it. I think that also. But oh. I had the uh, privilege and pleasure of working at the Chamberlain with um, senior residents. And yeah. there was a wonderful group of people there because they, most of them, because they were wealthy and had incredible jobs. And if you got to know them, it was cool. But this one particular couple I remember sharing about how much I hated math and whoever uses it and was blown away by their answer and they were very nice people could talk to anybody they didn't act like they were so intelligent but they actually said that they used the, the stupid 2x y and z things in life and here's one of the uh -huh. examples they gave which totally blew my mind if you would use it in anything but a classroom they were talking about it was several years ago probably five when they were talking about some football game where the the ball wasn't blown up to something oh, regulation. Yeah. Yeah. They said 
Mm. When they heard that, they sat there and said, hmm, and they worked it out, both of them together, and yeah. said, no, that can't be true, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I didn't even get it. They explained it to the best they could to me. Yeah. But they actually used that 2XYZ thing to get the answer. <laughs> just that in front of me. So anyway, she just gave me an answer that, hmm, different strips yeah. for different yeah. folks. <laughs> well, I, I got a backpedal here because God is a mathematician, right? Yeah, he is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He is, so maybe I need and to just, I don't know that we might have be <laughs> we might have to back off a little bit. <laughs> so we don't have to like it, but it's cool that uh, yeah. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. those who use and understand that. Yeah. There you go. And come to me for counseling because our brains they are not compatible. Yeah. I mean, yeah. even in in getting my degree, the professor of the statistics apologized right from the get go. He said, "I know your brain doesn't like this, yeah. but we're going to try to stretch it." <laughs> it That's a good math teacher. Yeah. I, yeah. He he did a good job. Yeah. Actually, yeah. understood some stuff. Wow. Yeah. I think you'd be an even funnier one. Uh, my buddy and I often go to the